Okay, the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> My name is Yasin Eldik. Woo! You all already knew that. And I have the pleasure of introducing this year's Class Day speaker. In 1993, the French fashion designer, Christian Louboutin, took red nail polish and painted the soles of a pair of stiletto shoes to make them, in his words, pop. More than two decades later, Almost a million pairs of his wildly famous red-soled Louboutin shoes sell every year. And as every smart law student knows, this level of success cannot be reached without at least one courtroom drama. In 2011, Christian Louboutin Sued, a Saint, sued Yves Saint Laurent for producing shoes that used a red sole. As evidence of trademark infringement, lawyers for Louboutin invoked Sarah Jessica Parker. The lawyers wrote, in episodes of Sex and the City, as well as in both Sex and the City movies, the lead characters regularly wore Louboutin footwear, referencing multiple photos of Ms. Parker as Carrie Bradshaw wearing Louboutin's red-soled shoes. These attorneys explained that the character of Carrie Bradshaw is, of course, played by famous actress and high fashion leader Sarah Jessica Parker. As a cultural icon and global superstar, lawyers cite to her. <laughs> the case got complicated, but let's just say Louboutin's trademark is still intact. The Harvard Law Library's Fashion and the Law exhibit features Ms. Parker's inclusion in this case. As the Louboutin lawyers understood, and as we all do, Sarah Jessica Parker is an institution. She has been working in film and television for almost 40 years. Miss Parker, or Sarah Jessica, has gone on to win two Emmy Awards, four Golden Globes, and three Screen Actors Guild Awards. And yet, as much as Ms. Parker has entertained us, making us laugh, breaking our hearts, and reminding us of the importance of friendship, she has harnessed her influence to make the world safer and better for those to whom society has been less kind. Ms. Parker has served as a UNICEF ambassador since 1997. She has raised funds for an initiative aimed at simplifying the detection and treatment of HIV AIDS in developing countries. As the first national spokeswoman for the UNICEF TAP project, she has helped bring clean water to developing countries. Having made her Broadway debut at the tender age of 11, Ms. Parker is a strong and consistent advocate for the arts. In 2009, President Obama appointed Sarah Jessica to the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, advising the White House on arts and humanities education, policy issues surrounding cultural exchange, and other topics. Ms. Parker has worked with public schools in Oregon and Minnesota as part of the Turnaround Arts Program helping low-performing schools increase student achievement through arts education. Some of Sarah Jessica's most recent work has focused on women military service members and veterans. She works with First Lady and Harvard Law School alum, Michelle Obama, on their Joining Forces initiative, which collaborates with employers 
to ensure that women service members, veterans, and their families have the tools they need to succeed throughout their lives. Sarah Jessica also serves as vice chair of the New York City Ballet Board of Directors. And through it all, Sarah Jessica has remained a fashion icon. She has graced the cover of Vogue magazine a whopping six times, a record I plan to break. <laughs> she is also an entrepreneur, having started her own fragrance and footwear lines. Sarah Jessica remarkably uses her influence and reputation to call attention to important social issues. Hopefully, once we leave Harvard Law School, we can do the same. Please join me in welcoming actress, producer, humanitarian, advocate, fashion maven, Yasin Aldeek's friend, <laughs> and all around superwoman, Sarah Jessica Parker. Oh, thank you, Yasin. I feel I've known you my entire life. I suspect I will. <laughs> On January 13th of this year, I received a most surprising and unexpected missive from Marcia Sells, your Dean of Students, requesting that I might consider speaking to you all on this special and important day in your lives. I was flattered, delighted, honored, so I immediately said no. <laughs> I don't think of myself as a conventional speaker for this type of occasion, but after much heated deliberation between terrified, cowardly me and brave, adventurous me, the better argument won. I said yes. And I've also known Marcia since I was eight years old, both of us little girls growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio. And now, as then, I still just want Marcia to like me. <laughs> in the days since accepting your gracious invitation, you have all been on my mind a lot, dominated somewhat by a concern that you really meant to invite Mary Louise Parker, or Camilla Parker Bowles, or Sarah Michelle Geller, or Neil Patrick Harris. But of course, my real and great concern was, what would I, could I say, to be deserving, nay, worthy of such an occasion? Because, you are the 2016 Harvard Law School graduates. A sort, of, a sort of highly impressive noun, a very fine noun, certainly distinguished, except in my experience, um, generally speaking, if you suddenly find yourself in a room facing a large number of lawyers, that's really not a good sign. That's like not a harbinger of good times ahead. Unless, of course, you're playing one on television. Um, Joanne Harris, Assistant District Attorney. Equal Justice, anyone? No, it's cool, it's cool. You weren't born yet. But gradually, I began to think of you less as a group and more as individuals. The collective part began to break away and reveal, at least in my imagination, each singular person, and there was this comforting, welcome shift when May 25th became not about me, but deservedly, appropriately, about you, about all of you. So at last we meet, and I finally now get to see all of you extraordinary men and women. 
and having thought of you for so long, having struggled to find the right words to inspire you, having been, frankly, haunted by you, I just want to say, get out of my head. <laughs> Sincerely, what I have been most looking forward to saying to you is how enormously proud I am of your accomplishments and if I am filled with this gushing pride, I can only imagine how your chests swell today, having arrived at this destination. I wish I could shout out your names one by one, but I know that's reserved for tomorrow. However, it seems a bit of a shame that after sitting seriously and attentively semester after semester to reach this amazing goal, you have to once again listen to someone else talk instead of letting your feelings out. So, wouldn't it be grand, isn't it right and good and entirely appropriate, after all you have done, to shout out to me and the world your own names? So it's a sort of unconventional exercise, but if you are game, on the count of three, I want you to shout your name and let it speak for your joy. Be your least modest self. Let the sound of your names be filled with all the feelings that describe these last three, the last years of your singular efforts. Do I have a majority? Do people want to shout their names out? All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, so well done, so well done. Not surprising that you did that so beautifully. I'm Sarah Jessica, and it's very nice to meet you. And good afternoon to Dean Minow, the Harvard class marshals, parents, students, faculty, and distinguished guests, President Arena, Professor Jeannie Sook, Gabriella Follett, and of course my friend, Dean of Students, Marsha Sells. I thank you all for including me today. Graduates, it is truly a profound honor to celebrate your achievement and a privilege to be asked to share some thoughts. As I mentioned, even though we've just met, you have become, over these last months, co-inhabitants, cohabitants of my life, a great part of my waking thoughts, the interrupter of other thoughts, thoughts I should be having, the cause of many sleepless nights, a distraction, and a beautiful burden. In other words, you've basically become my children, which means that I'd really just love it if you would text me back, uh, if you would maybe let me know if you're coming home tonight or not, and um, maybe this is a, a good bright time, you see, in good spirits to let you know that we've turned your bedroom into a um, den slash home office. As parents, our goal is to raise kind, happy, independent people. We want to send our children out into the world to share themselves, to connect, to contribute, to lead rich, complicated, challenging, and joyful lives. They must leave to do this. But thinking of this next chapter of your lives, I want to stand in front of every train that's about to hit you, I want to be there to assure you that you will recover from heartbreak, to convince you on your most blue day that you will not always feel so alone, to remind you not to sacri sacrifice your integrity, even when it might feel a much more swift avenue toward your goal, to whisper in your ear that other people's opinion of you doesn't have to be the opinion you keep of yourself to encourage you to think twice before saying nothing, to promise the job is coming, the romance around the corner, the full rich life you long for is just up ahead, and that you can indeed have life and literature. However, that would do you no good at all. And we parents and teachers don't really want that. And though at moments that might be tempting for all parties, you don't want that either. And like my own offspring, I have my hopes and ambitions for you. So the thoughts I offer you today 
are the same I offer to my children. Or rather, I would offer it if I didn't know it would only elicit a sort of tortured rolling of the eyes, like a certain 13-year-old in my house. Because when you're young or just beginning, advice is sort of like experience's boring cousin that no one really wanted to invite and arrives at the party about an hour early and just hangs around the kitchen criticizing the food. But if you'll indulge me, I do have a few thoughts. Things I've learned as an actor, a parent, a business person, a citizen, and as someone who has had the extraordinary good fortune to pursue the things that I love. So I have a list of hopes that I have collected and that I would like to be able to confer upon you. May I approach? <laughs> Number one, I hope that you can maintain your individuality, that you will find a way to continue to be the individual you discovered over these past years as you march toward this day. Please remember, even as you get swept by the current of desire, ambition, and great satisfaction, it was you alone who sorted all this out. You all did it your own way. You established systems of progress, preparation. Despite the help you may have received along the way, it was, in the end, an individual undertaking. I can share with you that there have been many attempts from the outside world to change me. My approach, my appearance, my choices. For the most part, I have resisted, much to the chagrin, often, of those who believe they had my best interest at heart. They simply wanted to make it easier for me, lessen the resistance I might find if I was willing to alter myself. I am not going to suggest that I was evolved enough to see the error in doing so. But there was a little voice that said, don't. Be gracious, listen, appreciate the care and advice, but there are times, Sarah Jessica, to keep your own counsel. As we say in acting, take the note, but do it your way. And I continue to believe in taking the good note from anyone, but be an original. So have a deep belief in who you are, what you want to say, what you look like, and cling to your sense of self and uniqueness. It is a great thing to know how to belong to oneself. We need more than ever. We are counting on you to, be, to bring your big, gorgeous, different, unconventional, crazy, just nuts, surprising, kind, innovative, unfamiliar ideas and selves. That's the energy that will spark the ideas and the collaborations that will change the world. As the beloved author A.A. A. Milne said about himself, the things that make me different are the things that make me. Number two. I hope that you honor and nurture your curiosity. Curiosity is way more powerful than comfort. Comfort is very seductive. It envelops you. It seems to ask nothing in return. It's necessary on occasion, but it can be a beautiful prison. Curiosity, I'm convinced, is the gateway to everything you know you want. I have found in my own life, both professionally and personally, that every time I throw myself into an exploration of the unknown, that I let curiosity lead, I receive new, bless you, and stimulating ideas and relationships that alter the course of my life. I have a peculiar addiction for any world that's not my own. I want to know as best I can the person most unlike myself. I want to travel to the far-flung region. I want to better understand the other side to see, I want to, smell, I, I want to smell it and see it and know the foreign, to experience the foreign, to be uncomfortable, to be the outsider. The most vibrant, engaging, and wonderfully exhausting experiences have come from my endless curiosity. I am a better mother, wife, friend, and colleague for it. 
But that means that I'm often in a smackdown with the new, the brand new, and I'm actually not at all a brave person. Despite what might seem a lack of self-awareness, I will tell you that my true nature is timidity. But I also know that my most valuable asset is my insatiable curiosity, and every time I call upon it, I am awakened. Number three, I hope you can know that to want is a gift. We are all different. We come from radically different backgrounds from all parts of the world. We have our own singular narratives and trajectories. But despite all those differences, I think we can all recall something that we really, really wanted, pined for, worked toward, put on a list, and finally, at last, earned or received. And the glory when it was ours. I never want to forget that feeling. I came from a family that struggled financially. I am one of eight kids. For the most part, as children, we had what we needed, but rarely the things we wanted. For many years now, I have recognized that this was and remains a great gift because it created in me a hunger, a focused ambition, a work ethic that is a sort of point of operation and pride for me. Despite the successes you are sure to achieve, material or otherwise, never stop wanting. In wanting is energy, surprise, youth, motion. In not wanting is inertia. Number four, I hope you will be dreamers. Not just dreamers, but big, really big dreamers. Dreamers of the what-ifs that seem on the surface impossible, but which hold the promise of great joy and wonderment and justice. I wholeheartedly disagree with the definition of dreamer as one who lives in fantasy, is impractical, or unrealistic. I much prefer the definition of dreamer as one who is considered audacious or visionary. Okay, first of all, dreaming is one of the most relaxing, restorative, wonderfully private occupiers of time. Secondly, dreaming holds the capacity to beautifully suspend time because there are no limits. That said, however, avoid the dangers of what in the theater we call being too result-oriented, a limiting and deceptive principle. It becomes a most unwelcome sort of very vigilant spam filter. I describe it this way. Creating the ending first, it forces you onto a one-way road, a sort of creative cul-de-sac, with no route for exploration or the unexpected. You can't produce a truly original thought or innovative thinking if you are backing into an idea with blinders on. So keep your field of vision wide open so that dreams may lead to other dreams. But here's the rub. It is not going to be a straight line. There are detours that necessity will dictate along the way. I have had many in my own life. You can probably name them. The bad television shows, the bad movies that I did to pay rent or to simply eat. But I refuse to let the those um, less than inspiring deviations erode my greater goals. At times, I felt very disheartened and a sense of deep disillusionment. But I was vigilant about hanging on to my dream. So I implore you not to give up. Even in the face of unthinkable discouragement, keep your greatest desires in safe shelter and marry your dreams to action. Number five, I hope that you learn to wrangle your fears. Don't try to vanquish them. Personally, I seem to encounter fear a lot. I'm like a heat-seeking missile. I'm on a, like a constant blind date with fear. And it often brings along its good friend anxiety. Um, I used to never talk about this. I was convinced that to admit to the fear out loud would only strengthen and embolden it. So I became a sort of expert at the shove, at the dismissal, but I found that it had legs and stamina. In fact, the more I tried to contain it, the more powerful it became. 
as if it was nourishing itself on my very resistance. So one day, I chose to address it formally. Hello, fear. And the modest act of acknowledging it was like putting a tiny needle in an overinflated balloon. The simple act of speaking its name gave me charge. So I encourage you to capture your fear, harness it, direct it, talk about it. You will find solidarity in others. Because come on, show of hands, who's, who, who's sort of kind of terrified 24 hours a day? All right, I'm in the minority. Number six, I hope you recognize that strength can come from disappointment. Living disappointment is like, it's like being kicked sideways. It's brutal. It's a, it's, it's a kick in the rubber parts. It's a low-grade, chronic stomach ache. Disappointment feels lonely and awful and unfair, but an outcome that can make you feel that lousy was surely worth your efforts. So feel it. Lounge in it. Suffer. Stay in bed. Indulge. Invite your friends over, eat too much, weep, moan, push on the bruise for two days. And then rally. And you will look back with fondness and even romance at those occasions. You will laugh, and most importantly, you will, you will be proud of what you did next. How it prepared you for the next disappointment. And you will learn that no matter how gutted, there is recovery. You will see the coping mechanisms you develop, the empathy you cultivate, how it makes you a better friend, partner, employee, employer, and person. Number seven, I hope you treasure the accumulation of the triumphs the world doesn't see. I spent years auditioning for roles, pounding the pavement. I got some jobs, I didn't get others. I was a journeyman, and I loved it. Every now and then I'm asked by young actors for advice, and I give the same advice to my son, whom, to our great delight, we have discovered is a serious student. I tell them, prepare. Prepare, but don't plan. Do everything within your means to be as informed as is possible. It's the process that's most important. I say, give the best audition you can. Walk in with confidence that you have something unique to offer. And afterwards, lay in bed at night knowing you did all you could within your resources to be ready. The goal is to feel good when you walk out of the door of that audition. It's the little triumphs that the world can't see that add up, that really stick, that give you sustenance. It's the ever, every effort that makes you better regardless of immediate reward. It has been my quiet private triumphs, even when I didn't get the part, which have guided me to my own personal success. Number eight, I hope you will always know that listening is your secret weapon. It is a demanding technique and can be particularly challenging for smart people who have so much to share. It requires an exhausting rigor and discipline, especially when faced with those whose opinions and ideology is anathema. By listening with a clear head and open heart, we can plant seeds of empathy and show others the most formidable artillery is knowledge and respect. Number nine, I hope you can distinguish the bad rules from the good ones. There used to be a blueprint, a sort of a set of recognized and reliable pathways, rules, that determined our careers, our expectations, and sometimes our future. But, and I don't have to tell you, the world has changed. We live in a time of unpredictability, instability, where change is common currency, and many of the old rules don't apply. Speaking as a bit of a rule breaker myself, I'm grateful for the absence of some of these more traditional rules of life. Rules that were used to define us from the outside, that characterized us by gender or class or race or orientation, and were used to limit our value, ambitions, and contributions. I would call these bad rules. But there is a rule 
for which I am particularly grateful and which deep in my heart I believe to be timeless and indisputable. The golden rule. Maybe that seems corny or naive. I don't even mind. I would much rather risk the accusation of being naive than shield myself in the comfortable confidence of cynicism. So as you redraw a path for your generation, I urge that you rely upon decency, principle, and nobility. They aren't qualities that we herald lately. We seem to have a great deal more interest in the stories of success. There is much ink spilled these days, well, not as much ink, a lot of blogging, that grab our limited attention by celebrating matters of money and fame, success, status. But success can and should mean being a trusted friend, partner, and collaborator being a person with a steady sense of goodness and a reliable compass pointing toward the humane and empathetic. I say without hesitation or embarrassment, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I fall short of this day's destination at times, but it is still the hook on which I hang my hat. It remains my beacon, the only rule I can always count on, and ultimately, I believe it's what gives us the most meaningful success, the admiration and trust of those whose lives we touch. At the end of the day, all we have is our honor. So there you have it, my nine hopes. I bet your hope is that I'm wrapping this up soon. But it occurs to me that there is a certain theme here to these hopes, and it connects both my world in the arts and yours in law, and that is, at its heart, in its very essence, bless you, and purpose, our work is about people, human beings, the beauty of a dramatic moment or perfectly reasoned argument is irrelevant if it lives in a world separate from the people it affects. And there is a certain larger context in which these hopes exist that we can't and shouldn't ignore. I know that these past few years, as students, as citizens, you have been involved in an unusual amount of challenges, change, and the struggle for change. In many ways, the power and recognition of and the resistance to change has defined our decade and century. Change, of course, is not always pleasant. It is certainly not always easy. But whether we like it or not, change is and always will be the natural state of the world, which is why the possibility of change, of transformation, transformation is the central dilemma of the great philosophies, of great religions, of art, and of course, of law. Change is what we simultaneously hope for and fear. It is both the corridor to all that is better and the last corner we turn. Not all change, of course, is to be celebrated. When we get sick and our bodies seem to turn against us, that's change we fight against. We employ every resource to counteract it and to regain our strength, to return to something, something like our former happy self, as we recall it our happy state. I think we all recognize that there is a sort of illness at loose in the world today, not an illness of decay or disrepair. It is far more insidious than that. It is an illness born of fear, and it is metastasizing in our political body, breaking down our sense of compassion of understanding, of acceptance, our ability to see each other as human. So I urge you to take what you can of these hopes, to attach them to the skills you have acquired, and use them to help us. Help guide us through these fears toward and through change, to do whatever you can 
to shape the world as a place that does lean toward justice and compassion. It's a big dream, nine hopes wrapped in one mighty dream. But if you capture the intelligence and the energy you have and allow it to benefit others, if you grant yourself the joy of discovering that when you give greedily, the returns can be monumental, well then, I have every confidence in you. The world anticipates and is in vital need of your next move. Be bold, be generous, throw yourself toward the unfamiliar. Let curiosity be your guide. After all, look at what you just did. You came here, individuals from all over the world. You worked alone or you found groups. You ate when you needed to, you slept when you could. You overcame every possible obstacle thrown in your path, whether by yourself or academic demands. You fought exhaustion, insecurities, and time. You found a community, you found a home, and most importantly, you found yourself. The world of law awaits your good sense, your unique perspective, and your careful consideration. Art, culture, politics, community, and the larger world beckon for your head and your heart. I know you are ready. The people rest.